wake up all week The walking dead From demolition man All the way to just dread the shit is fucked up They know what seems to listen They lace up your brew And modify your chicken To be done to the fact They got your name city and rank But you falling for the trap Tripping off titties and drink My whole generation going And I really hate to confess Fuck you big girl This is my state of address Even today Remember those sweet, warm New England summers? Tell if they have the regular seasonal flu or if they've contracted the 2009 H1N1 influenza virus. Well, for a person, him or herself, to be able to determine that would essentially be impossible because you can get everything from very, very mild illness to severe illness with either seasonal flu or the H1N1 new 2009 pandemic flu. Most of the time, it's a mild disease, uh, but there are unusual cases that can be severe. The only way a person can tell is if they get their blood drawn or other laboratory tests, which could specifically distinguish between one and the other. But that is something that is not done routinely. So if someone wakes up in the morning and feels that they're not uh, well, they get a fever, a muscle ache, some cough, the things that you would get with the flu, it would be very difficult for them to determine whether it's seasonal flu or the H1N1. However, circumstances that are going on in the community can give you a pretty big hint of what you have. Let me give you an example. When H1N1 historically has gone into a community, both in the United States in the spring of 2009, as well as what we're seeing in the Southern Hemisphere, in Argentina, Chile, Australia, in South Africa, it generally overwhelms and crowds out the seasonal flu. So if you're in a community in which we know from surveillance that 99% of the cases of flu are really H1N1, you can make a reasonable assumption that your illness is due to H1N1. If there's a mixture of both, or if there's still a lot of seasonal flu in the community, you may not be able to distinguish between one and the other. Remember sipping lemonade underneath a shady tree? So the answer is yes, you should get the H1N1, if you're not in one of the five priority groups, then you may need to check with your physician or healthcare provider when it would become available to you. Just to be clear, the five priority groups are pregnant women, people who are the caretakers, parents, or what have you, of children less than six months old, healthcare workers, young children and young adults from six months to 24 years old, and individuals from 25 to 64 who have underlying medical conditions that would compromise them and put them at a higher risk for complications. Remember when you hit that pedestrian with your car at the crosswalk and then just drove away? Well, there are things that people can do to reduce the likelihood of their getting infected and to reduce the likelihood of their infecting others. And let's talk about reducing the likelihood of your getting infected. First thing, importantly, wash your hands frequently because we know that you can get infected by touching an inanimate object that someone who was infected touched and then touch your nose or your lips or your eyes. Try and stay away as much as possible from rubbing your eyes or your nose or your mouth because that's a very good way to, to transmit the virus. The other thing is to avoid, particularly when there's flu in the community, avoid places where there are people who are sick and coughing and it's a crowded place. Now that's difficult to do. You can't isolate yourself from the rest of the world for the whole flu season, but use some good judgment in that. How you can prevent giving it to others is if you're sick, don't go to school or parents should not send their children to school if they're sick. If you're sick, don't go to work. If you're coughing or sneezing, cover it with a tissue or sneeze or cough into your elbow. Do those kinds of things, as well as washing your own hands because you may give it to somebody else from what's on your own hand. So if you look at the theoretical, but very, very, very small risk of there being anything that's gonna be deleterious with a vaccine, 
And yet the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic and we're seeing a lot of people getting infected and we're seeing that some of them are getting seriously ill, particularly people in these high risk categories like pregnant women and children and people with underlying conditions, so that the risk of not being protected against influenza balanced against the risk of the vaccine and then the benefit of getting vaccinated versus the benefit of being protected from the uh, uh, influenza that you can get infected. It, it is no doubt that the balance of risk benefit strongly favors the benefit of vaccine because of the risk of influenza versus the relatively small risk of the vaccine. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Thank you for watching, like, share, and subscribe.